I'm Dr. Miles of the Naval Air Warfare Center in China Lake, California. The title of my talk is The Anomalous Heat and Helium Production Using Palladium Boron Alloys in Heavy Water. We've narrowed the focus slightly to just the palladium boron alloys. Uh, also co-authors with me are Kendall Johnson, also of China Lake, and Dr. Imam of the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C. Dr. Imam is the one that prepared the palladium boron alloys that I'll be discussing today. Our program objectives is to answer two basic questions. Is the apparent excess power real? Based on our work, that answer is yes. The second question, can the excess power be reproduced regularly? The answer based on our work is no, and also the work of many other uh, laboratories. Our success in obtaining ex excess power varied greatly with the source and batch of palladium that we used, and that has been found also by other laboratories. So a major goal in our program was to produce materials within the Navy at Naval Research Laboratory uh, that would give reproducible excess power effects. Our first studies concerned palladium made by the Naval Research Laboratory, but our success rate was quite poor. Only one out of six experiments at our laboratory gave excess heat using palladium. We then tried palladium silver alloy and did not have any success with that alloy. No experiments out of three gave excess heat. Towards the end of the program, we did have success with the palladium boron alloys. Uh, at our laboratory, seven out of eight of these alloys, experiments with these alloys, gave uh, excess heat. Seven out of eight was the highest success ratio that we had in any, uh, with any type of material. This uh, view graph shows the design of our calorimeter. Uh, this is the palladium, the palladium rod that we used in the center. This is surrounded by a platinum counter electrode or anode. The cell was filled with heavy water containing LiOD and we measured the temperature of our cell by two thermistors. This differed from most other designs in the fact that we placed our thermistors on the surface, outside surface of the cell in a gap filled with water, distilled water. And so we measured the temperature difference between the wall of the cell and the water bath out here. The thermistors were placed at opposite sides of the cell at two different uh, uh, elevations or levels. The calorimetry that we used at China Lake was an open system, isoparabolic system. Our accuracy was plus or minus 20 milliwatts or plus or minus 1% of the input power, whichever turned out to be larger. Our basic equ equation cons consists of the electrochemical power in the voltage times the current. Uh, we subtract off here the thermal neutral potential. Uh, this is the Faraday efficiency. This is the current that we used. This is the excess power, if any. This is a constant that relates to uh, power losses out of the top of the cell. This is our calorimetric constant. This is the temperature difference, the difference between the thermistors at the st on the wall of the cell and the temperature of the water bath. This was power losses due to the gas streams coming out of the cell. And, and this is power changes due to the calorimeter, calorimeter itself, the, the temperature change of the water in the calorimeter or the weight change of the mass or the mass change of the water in the, in the calorimeter. Uh, the Faraday efficiency is always important to measure that accurately. Uh, this was always checked by the rate of gas evolution volumetrically that came out of the cell by displacement of water. We also measured it at the end of each day the volume of D2O added and compared it to Faraday's law. And we could always see the rate of gas flowing through the oil bubbler that we used. So we always had three checks on the Faraday efficiency in every experiment. Our excess heat production typically was 5 to 10 percent larger than the input power. Our largest excess heat effect was uh, a 30 percent excess heat. Uh, this generally gave 1 to 5 watts per cubic centimeter of palladium that was used. Generally, we needed an induction period of 6 to 14 days before we ever saw any evidence of excess heat. Uh, we, we had a threshold current density. We did not see excess heat unless we were operating at a current density of 100 milliamps per square centimeter or larger. And the, our success varied with the source of the palladium that we used. These results are similar to those at SRI. In fact, they're almost identical, very, very similar to what re was reported by Mike McCurby at SRI similar to Pons and Fleischmann and many other laboratories that have reported uh, excess heat effect. The, uh, 
Plate and boron alloys that we used were prepared at Naval Research Laboratory by Dr. Imam. He, he weighed out boron concentrations to give three uh, concentrations, 0.75 weight percent, 0.50 weight percent, and 0.25 weight percent. Uh, analysis, however, showed that the actual concentration was 0 0.62, 0 0.38, and 0.18. This is not unexpected because boron has a higher vapor pressure than palladium, and you expect some loss of boron during the high temperatures involved in the melting to form the alloy. So this was the actual concentration. This is what was weighed out. Nevertheless, even though this is a small weight percent, this still calculates out to be one atom of boron per every 12 atoms of palladium. X-ray diffraction showed that these materials were all two-phase materials. They had two, two distinct phases of the same cubic structure. Our first experiment on a palladium boron alloy produced excess heat. This is the experiment shown here. Uh, after uh, about a week of electrolysis, we see some excess heat effect here. But particularly during the last half of the experiment, there was more or less a steady excess heat effect averaging out at about 100 milliwatts of, of excess power. So a rather steady excess heat effect throughout this period right through here. Our best excess power effect with palladium boron was our second experiment shown here. We charged it for about a week at low current density where it was difficult to do calorimetry. But so this is about a week into the experiment when we turned the current up to 100 milliamps per square centimeter or larger. And we see excess heat, excess power developing here. If you average this out, it seems like there is a steady increase with, as the days went by with the excess power produced. Later in the experiment, we got excess power uh, up to as high as 300 milliwatts of excess power. So this was the largest effect that we ever saw with the palladium boron alloy producing up to 300 uh, milliwatts of excess power. An experiment ran in parallel with the one I just showed is this experiment. Uh, so it had exactly the same conditions, but there was never any real strong evidence of excess power. You see fluctuations here, but it averages it out pretty close to zero. Uh, so no significant excess power in this experiment, even though it was ran in parallel at the same time under the exactly the same conditions. We later found a reason for this. This plate and barn is a very hard material, and in swaging it, one part, of, some of the material, some of the metal got folded over on top of, of, of other metal, and this acted as a long crack. It's well known in cold fusion experiments that any type of cracks or any cracking during the experiment uh, uh, causes a deloading effect and a, a loss of ex excess power. So since this had a, a, a long defect that acted as a crack, it's not surprising that this one experiment did not produce excess power. And this is the only boron experiment that we ran where there was no excess power effect. In one of the plating boron experiments, we collected the electrolysis gas and analyzed for helium-4. Uh, we found an excess helium production of 5.6 times 10 to the 13th atoms per 500 milliliters of the D2 and O2 gas that we collected. This, this is after we sub subtract off the background. There's always a background level of helium, but after subtracting the background, we had an excess of this amount shown here. During the time period of the gas collection, our excess power was 0 0.120 watts. The time to produce the 500 milliliters of electrolysis gas was 4,660 seconds to produce the 500 milliliters of gas. Under our laboratory conditions, that is operating at 500 milliamps current, our temperature is 296 Kelvin, and at the high desert location, our pressure is 690 torr. So a simple calculation using these numbers, the 5.6 times 10 to the 13th atoms of helium-4 in excess, divided by the 4,660 seconds, divided by the excess power, 0 0.120 watts, gives us 1.0 times 10 to the 11th helium atoms per second per watt. And if you compare this with theoretical values, this is the correct magnitude for a typical deuteron fusion reactions that produce helium-4 as a product. In fact, if you compare some typical fusion reactions, the theoretical rate of helium production per watt, the DD fusion going to helium-4 gives you 2.6 times 10 to the 11th. There's some other reactions here involving tritium or lithium-6 or lithium-7 
but you see they're all in the range of 10th, 11th helium atoms per second per watt, uh, very close to what we measured in the palladium boron experiment. This view graph presents a summary of our results at China Lake. Uh, we report seven out of eight experiments using this palladium boron cathode produced excess power. The one experiment that did not uh, had a flaw and a long crack, so it's not surprising that the one failed. Our helium-4 production rate from the one plate and boron alloy that we investigated for helium-4 production gave a value of 1.0 times 10 to the 11th helium-4 atoms per second per watt. This is a correct magnitude for typical deuteron fusion reactions that yield helium-4 as a product. And this result is in agreement with many other experiments at our laboratory. We've actually performed 33 experiments investigating excess heat and its correlation with helium-4. And uh, when, we've had, when we've had excess heat, we have had excess helium production. When there's no excess heat, we find no excess helium production. We found this result in 30 out of the 33 experiments that we studied. To get 30 out of 33 to come out with the right answer, excess helium when excess power is present, no excess heat when no excess power is present, that probability is about one in a million. If you add on to that the probability of getting the correct magnitude of helium-4 production, 10 to the 11th atoms per second per watt, then that, the odds become very, very small that that could be due to random error. So I'm, I'm very certain from our results there is a helium-4 production correlated with their excess power effect. The results at China Lake, a report on all of our experiments is summarized in a final report. This is the report for the Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division. It is a technical publication number 8302, Anomalous Effects in Deuterated Systems, published September 1996. So this gives a complete description of all, our, all of the experiments conducted at China Lake. I was also asked by the meeting organizer to comment on papers at the uh, Cold Fusion Conference in Japan. This was the sixth international conference held in Hokkaido, Japan in October 13 through 18, 1996. And I only have time to report on some very, uh, very few highlights of this meeting. To me, the major breakthrough perhaps is coming from Italy. Uh, Professor Preparata in Milan, Italy, based on his theory, has been using a very thin palladium wire cathode. It is only 50 microns in diameter and it's 250 centimeters in length, and it's wound many, in many, many coils. And using this design with the, the palladium on the outside and the, and the anode, platinum anode in the center, just switching positions of what is typically used, he is getting reproducible excess heat effects. And not only that, he is get, getting very high power densities in the range of 50 to 100 kilowatts of power per cubic centimeter of palladium. This is in the range or, in, in, or exceeds the range of power density of nuclear reactors. Now Solani, who is not too far away in Frescati, Italy, has also been using the design suggested by Preparata. He's been studying palladium as well as palladium yttrium alloys, and he reports up to 200 watts of excess heat. So we see this thin wire design in Italy where progress is being made perhaps to get a reproducible uh, uh, excess power effect and, and a very large effect at that. Also at this cold fusion conference in Japan, uh, Pons and others report on a new calorimeter they call the Icarius 9, designed to operate under boiling conditions. Fleischmann and Pons found that once you get the palladium loaded at low temperatures, then if you go to high temperatures you get larger effects. So this calorimeter is designed to operate under, under conditions where the, where the uh, detail is boiling but yet it condenses and goes back down in the cell. He found excess heat in three cells out of the eight tested, and he had a large excess power effect up to 200% uh, of the input power. In another study, very interesting, was reported by Longchamp. This study was authorized by the French Atomic Energy Commission. They wanted to see if the results of Fleischmann and Pons reported by them in 1993 could be reproduced. So they did the experiment in every detail, exactly the same as reported by Fleischmann and Pons, and, and they successfully reproduced this experiment. They found excess heat, uh, 
similar to Fleischmann ponds, up to 150% excess heat effect. So here we have a study by the French Atomic Energy Commission, which reproduces in detail the Fleischmann ponds experiments and gets nearly the same results. Finally, the, the last two papers I found very interesting in the meeting in Japan was one reported by George Miley. Now he's professor at the University of Illinois. He's also editor of Fusion Technology, so he's well known in, in, in uh, uh, fusion circles. He used a thin film coating. Uh, this coating was nickel and palladium on very small plastic microspheres. Uh, this is similar to the Patterson cell a flowing pack bed type electrolytic cell with one molar lithium sulfate light water electrolyte. And even though he has found excess heat, he m focused mainly on the uh, yield of transmutation products. He analyzed all the metals that he found after the experiment. And he found a very surprising result, up to 40 atom percent transmutation of the thin film of new elements produced that were not there when the, when the experiment started. So this is quite a striking result if it holds up to further test. Uh, Dr. Mizuno of Japan also reports transmutation products using the palladium heavy water as well as the gold light water electrolysis. And he finds the isotopic distribution uh, after the experiment differs radically from the natural isotopic distributions that would be expected. So these were the outstanding papers in that I would like to comment on in Japan. I thank you for your time.